Today's reading is from the fourth chapter, John. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything <coughs> I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words... Many more became believers. Here ends the reading. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Oh, we can dance. There we go. That's almost as long as a sermon today, isn't it? My golly, huh? Well, this is our final week, the third week of our series called Operation Andrew. It's focused us on hopefully having a greater passion uh, for outreach to others, to bring them in so that they may know Jesus, so that they may see what we have come to see and what a relationship with him is all about for now and forevermore. The first week, we asked these questions. We said, why in the world would we want to invite people to be in a relationship with him? And we saw that and we use a great deal of scriptural basis that, that really this was the way of Jesus. The scriptures say that he came to seek and to save the lost. 
This was the way of his first disciples. We saw Andrew, as soon as he came to know Jesus, the first thing he did was go out and tell his brother Simon Peter and to bring him to Jesus. So we see the, that the identity of Jesus' ministry, the disciples' ministry, the identity of the New Testament, the early church, is to seek those who are lost. And that is the commission that the scriptures give to you and I as the body of Christ. We then went on and said, well, if we're going to invite, who do we invite? And we all were encouraged to look at our own personal mission field. And over 2,300 names have been given for people to be prayed for, placed before the cross of our Lord, people that we feel need to be reconnected or need to be brought into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and we name these people, we claim them, and are lifting them up in prayer now and throughout the month of March because we know that God changes lives through prayer. We had somebody on our staff this week who said, you know, Pastor Paul, I put seven names down and two of the people on my list have called me and have gotten reconnected to the ministry here. Prayer works. So then after that first week, we then said, if we're going to invite people and we've named them and claimed them, what do we invite them to? Last week, we said we invite people to know God, just not by knowing him by facts in their head, but really knowing him personally in their heart. We invite people to know assurance for their souls, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that death will not have a final say on any of us who believe in him. We invite people to the best relationships that they can know in life. Hopefully here we can get it right. And we can have relationships that we can depend on and that people will be there. And when people come to us in those relationships, what did we say? That they bring God and his love and his grace with them to us. We invite people. We invite people to know the joy of serving. God has given the church a wonderful structure on this earth to work through, to show us the joy that life is about giving ourselves for others. And we invite people to change. We need to change, don't we? God isn't finished with any of us yet. God's always moving us forward. And we want that for the people that we're placing up for prayer. And so now what do we do? That we've looked at why we invite, who we invite, what we invite them to. So today is about how we invite. And the first thing I thought we would focus on when we think about inviting others we need to start by looking at ourselves. The first thing I believe we need to do is to make sure that you and I are in a right relationship with God. It is hard to be genuine. It is hard to be effective in inviting other people to church or into a relationship with God if we ourselves aren't where we need to be with God. But when we're right with God, we want to invite other people. And so at this time, when you and I are lifting others up before the Lord and inviting them to come to know him, maybe it's a wonderful time for you and I to begin again with Jesus. Maybe we have sins in our lives that we need to confess. We might have habits that are keeping us away from where we ought to be with Jesus that we need to let the Lord really help us with and put, us, put behind us. Maybe we need to be better disciplined to be in prayer more often with God, to be in worship more consistently. Maybe we need in, in our lives to be able to, to reach out to more people because we first have, have gotten ourselves involved in God's word and in Bible study. Maybe this is a time as we think about who God needs to be for others, maybe it can be a great time for us to begin again with God. And not just with God, but I think it's important for us to be right with each other. I don't see this a lot here at Trinity. I really don't. But if we're going to invite other people to come and be with us and to know Jesus Christ, we need to make sure that we're not inviting them. It's hard to genuinely invite people if we're inviting them to, what, contentious relationships between ourselves. And so it's important for us to make sure that if words need to be spoken between us, if there needs to be forgiveness, if, if we need to be stronger, 
we need to make sure, as long as whatever is up to us, that we make sure that this church is the healthiest body of Christ that it can be. And that's what we're inviting people to. When we're looking at ourselves, the third thing is to make sure that we're maintaining a positive testimony before others. I, I love the book of James, and I love where James talks about faith. But he says this. He says, some people will say that you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. One of the great testimonies that we can give at work, with our neighbors, with our friends, wherever we go, is that you and I are living and displaying the spirit of, of Christ's love and how we live and how we're sharing life with people. I really believe this. What we are, what we are, speak so much more loudly to people before we can ever even say a word to them about what Jesus means to us. And so God calls us to be that type of testimony. And we need to remember when we go into the world, folks, we are the church. And when we invite people to church, there's a lot of baggage that can come with that for people. When people hear the word church, it can open up old wounds. It can remind them of unmet expectations. When we invite people to church, it might bring up stereotypes that aren't too positive or preconceived notions to overcome. But if we invite them, and they don't see that we're inviting them, what, to just be a member or to be part of a group or a clique, but we invite them... And they see that what that means is they can be a part of us. And because of what they've seen in us is God's love and grace. And God can use that. He can use that in a powerful way. And the last thing, when we look at ourselves, I, I believe it's important that we know our church. That you and I know what, what's the mission of Trinity. To connect people with God and each other. It's important for us to know the facilities and the ministries and the people who work with certain ministries here. Important to, you know, peruse the, the bulletin and the newsletter. Once in a while to go on the website. See, see what this church is doing for outreach to others. We're not the only place where God is working. The only place where the Holy Spirit's alive. But when you're reaching out to people God's placed in your life... It's important to know how God can meet their needs here and for you to be aware of what your church is about. So the first thing, how do we invite? I think we start with ourselves. And the second thing I would say is that we stay persistent in prayer. So you see the first two things or even before we go out and share life with people. And two things I hope you and I can pray for. One is that we would have the same type of heart that God does for those who are lost. I mean, take a moment with me, please. And if we really believe that it matters, that if you believe and trust in Jesus, that you'll go to heaven. And if we believe that if you're not in a relationship with him, that you won't. Then how can we not have a burden for those who are lost? And if you don't have it, if I don't have it as your pastor, let's pray that God would give us that type of heart. And also to pray that God would give us courage. That when we have the opportunities maybe to reach out to other people, that we would speak that word. That we would share what God's doing in our life. That we would invite. And I want to say this to you. Most of the time, invitations to others to know God, that won't come when things are hunky-dory in someone's life. Many times the door is open when things aren't great in other people's lives, when, when relationships aren't the best, or when they've lost a loved one, or when they're having trouble with their job or their family, whatever it might be. It is in those moments that people can really see how God can meet their needs. It's just as simply for us to say to someone, you know, I think my church can help you with that. And it's not until those types of things are happening. Remember, Mother Teresa said this. She said, you really don't know how much you need God until God is all you got. And that's so true. And so when people that we love and we care about, friends of ours, when they're really struggling with things, boy, the door is open for God, what? To be all that they got. 
and to show them how God can meet their needs, to pray for those things. The third thing now about getting out and going, I think we need, when it comes to inviting others, we need to make sure that we get to know Fran. Fran stands for friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors. You know, I'm not trying today, I'm not going to give you a perfect sales pitch in this series to finish it of, this is what you do to bring people to Jesus. You know, do you ever get those calls on the phone where people are trying to sell something? And you can tell they're reading from a paragraph that's printed in front of them. They're going through, and you try to interrupt them, but they, they got to get through it because they know the longer they keep you on the phone, the better chance they have to sell. And then if you tell them no, you can tell, well, if, if I told them no, then they go down to paragraph 6A and they continue on. Well, Mr. Austin, I believe if you just give me a minute, right? They got that perfect sales pitch. That's not what I think it's about. What I believe it's about is instead of going out with the perfect sales pitch, it's going out with a commitment to develop relationships with other people and to go where they are. I think that's where our text comes in today. Jesus, let me just share a little bit with you. Jesus you know, is in the area of Samaria. And we know the history there is that in the northern kingdom that the Assyrians came in and took over the northern kingdom. They took many Jews away to exile, but also many Jews were left behind in the land. And many of those foreigners, now the Assyrians, came in and established themselves in the land to keep order and peace. The Jews that were left behind, what they ended up doing is many started to intermarry with these foreigners. And so the Jews in the southern kingdom saw that as betrayal and saw them as not being pure Jews anymore. And so there was great hatred between the pure Jews and those that they called Samaritans who had intermarried with foreigners. So this woman, as a Samaritan, someone hated by the Jews, she didn't come to get water at the well. Wells were usually right outside the town at Jacob's well. She didn't come in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening when all the other women came. But she came in the middle of the heat of the day. Why? Because she didn't want to be there with other people. We also know, as Jesus talks to her, that she was considered a woman who was living in sin, not just because she had been married, let's say, five times, but now the relationship she was in wasn't even with her husband. So we see that she was someone who had been labeled. And also a third strike against her was normally any respectable Jewish man would never talk to a woman in public in this way. But notice where Jesus meets her. He meets her at the well where she is going to be. And you see, Jesus doesn't stand at the edge of the synagogue in the town and the woman's walking by with her water jar and he says, Hey, 1045, Sunday morning, we have worship. Why don't you come and join us? He doesn't do that. He goes to where she is, to her space. And he shows her that that he can offer living water that will quench one's thirst for God. And then what does she do? She then goes back to the people that she shares life with and tells them about Jesus and then brings them to him. Both are wonderful examples of us going and doing what? Going to where the people are and beginning to build those relationships and that's how Jesus does his entire ministry. You know, I, I heard a sermon a while back from a gentleman by the name of Erwin McManus. And he talks about you and I have three different spaces in our lives. The first space is our comfort space. It's a space where we live and we thrive, where people are like us. It's a place that we're very comfortable with. It can be our home. It can be our church. It can be anywhere where everybody knows our name. And I'm not talking about cheers, all right? Okay? But it's a place where relationships are close and long established. So you and I probably have a place that's our first space. It's our most comfortable space in life. A second space is a common ground that we share with others. That's the space that could be work. It could be school, a public area a place where we interact with others, but it's not as intimate as that first space. And then a third space for all of us is a space where we are a foreigner. It's a place that might be a first space for someone else, 
but it's a place that's very uncomfortable for us and very unfamiliar to us. When you and I invite someone to know Jesus who doesn't know him, when you and I invite someone to come to church who doesn't come to church, we're inviting them to a foreign space. We're inviting them to a space that is very uncomfortable and usually unfamiliar to them. And if we just invite, 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 and never build a relationship, people will never come, or ultimately they'll come out of guilt one time, and that'll be it. But what we need to do if we minister like Jesus is we need to go to other people's first space, even though it may be a very unfamiliar space to us, even though it may be uncomfortable for us. And we need to meet them there for God to work. I'll give you an example. Six, seven years ago, there was a gentleman that I was talking with, and he, he wasn't going to come to this space. He wasn't going to come to worship or come and sit in my office, okay? And where we were going to meet, if he was going to talk about things in his life, about struggles, even about the Lord, I was going to need to go to his space. So at 5.30, happy hour was until 6.00. I showed up at a bar, and I sat front and center at a stool at a bar during happy hour in Bel Air, and there were a lot of things going on around me that Pastor Paul doesn't approve of. (laughs) If you would have walked into that bar, and if you would have saw me at that bar, you would have said, what in the world is going on? (laughs) Now, I don't believe, I think Scripture speaks clearly against drunkenness. I'm someone that may have a glass of wine once in a while. I may have a beer and a blue moon. I don't drink, but I may have something like that once in a while. I had a beer with this man at the bar. I ate a cheeseburger with him. I had seven other glasses of water with lemon, okay? (laughs) But that two and a half hours that we spent there, I went to a space as a minister, I was a little bit uncomfortable. But that man, because of what God did in me, not because of me, ended up coming here, has been here for seven years, joined this church, and is an active leader in this place. And it would have never happened if I would not have been open to go to his space instead of forcing him first to come to mine. That's how Jesus did ministry. That's how we need to do ministry. We need to go where people are and to build relationships. That's how we invite. And the last thing I'd say to you then is let's invite. Let's invite. You've you've heard it said, I'm sure, many times, people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. We need to look at the people we've placed on our prayer list, the people that are on our minds, and we need to really plan about how we're gonna reach out to them. You can't reach out to every person the same way because people are different. Now, we're gonna get, we've given you a calendar. We've, we've only highlighted a few things that are going on during the month of March. You know, a new Wednesday night series, a new Sunday sermon series, um, places where you can volunteer, youth events, different things going on, the new Sunday schedule, all those things. But you need, I would say, to go out and to build the relationships this week, next week, the third week. And if those relationships then allow you then to invite, invite, invite them to come. I want to encourage you not to be discouraged because many people won't respond the first or the second or the third time. But continue just with courtesy and without being pushy, just continue to encourage people. And you'll see that that God will, will bless those relationships. A good kind of guideline is on the board, you'll see the ABCs of outreach. A, always look for opportunities to invite others. So it's a mindset that we have. It's a mission we have. B, be ready to seize the opportunity. C, communicate in a way that it says you care. D, don't be pushy. There may be future opportunities. So we've talked about why we invite. We've talked about who we invite, what we invite them to today. We've talked about maybe how about going about it. So now what do we do? What do we do during the month of March? What do we do? Well, let me share this story to close. It's a woman who was very frustrated, and she went to her minister, and she told him that she was really ready to give up, that she, where she worked at her factory, she felt like she was the only 
Christian that worked there, and people knew that she was Christian, and she would receive a lot of kidding, a lot of taunts, a lot of sneers, and she was really ready to give up. She was ready, actually, just to resign from her position. The minister responded to her by saying, well, answer this question for me. Where do we put light bulbs? And she looked at the pastor like, what in the world is he asking me that for? And, and she said, what does that have to do with anything? He said, well, just answer the question for me. Where do we put light bulbs? And she said, I guess we put light bulbs where darkness is. And he said to her, God has placed you where you are in that place of spiritual darkness because you are the one to be his light in that place. And for the first time in her life, she really saw where God had placed her, placed her in a totally new way, as a, as a place of opportunity. I will not go where you go. You will not go to the places where I go. You have different people around you than I have around me. But you see, God will ask you to go where you are to go and for me to go where I go and wherever we go. That is where we are to be the light. Huh? Let's not miss the opportunity. Don't you doubt it. God will and can and use you in this way. And it may mean, just may mean, somebody you love and you care about will one day be with us forever because of what God has done through us. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for your love and your grace. We thank you for the gift of yourself upon the cross, your life, your death, and resurrection, what that means for forgiveness and salvation, what that can mean for other people that we hope that you'll use us as a community of faith to reach out to. Lead us to be like Andrew, to go to others simply to say, hey, I, 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 this is what I've come to know. I can't convince you. Just come and see. Come and see. And when his people come and as they have had relationships with us and begin to build a relationship with you, we just pray that you would, that you would be a blessing to give them the living water upon which we all thirst for. In your name we pray, amen.